for our generation. And um, so you pass it on to the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. And um, humans are not the owners of the earth, but the more the maintainers. Right. There is a stewardship movement in Christianity that was that what the Bible meant was stewardship, right? Yeah. Didn't mean that you master the earth. <laughs> That's a translation, right? Yeah. The translator had an agenda. Um, and certainly at that time, nobody thought of the way that we are re-engineering the whole natural system. They did not have that in mind, right? They just meant, you know, not letting yourself be killed all the time <laughs> by wild animals or you know, being able to have crops to eat or something. It was a lot less invasive and a lot closer to meeting basic needs. Um, uh, so what else, Jack, anything else? No, that was all. Okay, so uh, we are the, are the caregivers of the earth. And what was the other one? Um. It's not just for our generation. Oh yeah, right. It's a legacy. Mm -hmm. We inherit and pass on, right? Yes, ma'am. So again, the Greeks talk a lot about that. Like you should worry about your legacy. Um, and in the Iliad, Odysseus goes down and sees three people in Hades and they teach you three lessons that are really interesting. Agamemnon is just completely miserable because he got stabbed to death with his wife, by his wife. That is like the lowest of the low. Nobody goes that low. So he went from being the most powerful person in the world, <laughs> like the guy who won the war. He was number one. He went from number one to absolutely the bottom of the heap. You know, your average Joe doesn't get stabbed to death by his wife. So, so that's about, hey, guy, <laughs> you know, don't get too full of yourself. Uh, you know, you need to behave. You never know what's going to happen. Don't, don't be proud. Don't think you're in charge. Um, the second one is Achilles says, I'd rather be a farmer on earth than Achilles down here because you get to live. And so the idea is you should live, right? And well, with Agamemnon, look at the legacy he left behind. He thought he was gonna leave this legacy of being the champion. And he left this legacy of, oh boy. And Achilles was gonna be the big hero and he's just so mad because he'd much rather be alive and be a farmer than have to be in Hades. And so that's however bad life gets, you should live. You should be grateful you're alive, right? And then Ajax had a grudge because he wasn't given Achilles armor after he died. And he, he had a big grudge. Well, now he lives with this grudge for eternity. So that message is like, get over your grudges, just move on, right? Um, so it's about just keep thinking about the legacy, keep thinking about the story that you leave behind and always try to live a full life, no matter what happens. Don't get too full of yourself. Um, and then that's where I really feel like my generation has, done you wrong. So one of the main reasons I'd like to keep teaching is that I would like to teach in a way that that helps student develop helps students develop strength and resilience for what they're going to have to face and uh, whether or not they realize it. And I just I don't know any other colleagues who have that mission in mind. But I do think it's important. So that's why I would want to stay in the game.
Does that make sense, Jack? Yes, ma'am. So based on everything I know, and I, I've been following it for 52 years, but I don't follow the science. I follow the culture. Um, I just think you all are going to have really, really difficult issues. And um, you should, what I'd like you to think about is how COVID has taught you resilience. Or if it hasn't, how you can rethink it to the point where you can use it as your first example of having this thing hit because it's not going to be the last. So if you can um, rethink it and remember and think about how you reacted this time and think about how you might be able, first of all, not to have a negative reaction, but also somebody's got to lead. Somebody's got to be the leader who doesn't lose their head or doesn't fold into depression when the next crisis hits, which it will. Um, so anyway, getting back to Mohammed, um, the lesson, you know, the main lesson in our chapter on Islam is that Islam has the same values and virtues. And, you know, the news is going to make it look like these incompatibilities between Christianity and Islam, it was inevitable that we were gonna have all this animosity, or it was inevitable that China and the US are gonna just destroy each other. It's not inevitable. Um, and everywhere in these places, kids are learning the Analects of Confucius. And then they're thinking if Americans they're gonna think Americans are rotten because of the way the news is. We're self-indulgent, we're violent, and they're gonna think, you know, our system is better. Authoritarianism is better. And um, the Muslims, if the kids are raised with these values of Muhammad, unless they read about what Jesus really said, you know, we can find common ground. And I, I think the Greeks are a good starter because nobody believes there's 12 gods on Mount Olympus. You know, they kind of know the stories are about us. But, um, but so I just give you these tools, right? This, these that I think could help you articulate to yourself and other people why there's no reason that religion should be a weapon. And there's every reason why religion should be a foundation for sustainability and cooperation. Um, what did you get out of the reading, Mia? You actually kind of touched on it a little bit, which is the leadership aspect of things specifically with um, like, I thought it was a sort of a revolutionary move, I guess. I don't know if that's the correct word I should use. But with, like, giving, uh, I guess, women more rights specifically. But, uh, like, the first one that comes to mind is whenever I was reading about how, like, women are, are like, automatically admitted into inheritance. And granted, they get half as much as, like, men. But it's still something that is, like, what, like, I guess man, not, this isn't the really right word, but like mandated, it's something that's enforced. And I think that that's like a very big, like that is so important, I think, because I feel like we don't, there's not, that's giving everyone like kind of a say, it's like making sure that, I don't know, I, I just, I like that. And I think that that was like a very big move. And so I talked about kind of like leadership and having like the gall to have, like do things like that, that are different than what's kind of going around in the world around. So I, yeah, that's sort of. Pretty much what I how far ahead they are like john stuart mill in england in the 1800s 1850 women had no property rights i mean <laughs> muhammad right 600 <laughs> right 1200 years earlier it's amazing yeah yeah <laughs> 
and the tell um Taliban, right, is horrible. Like one of my students from AU, AUW was talking to her this week and her cousin was at a woman's school that got bombed uh, last week. Uh, and we don't hear that much about it, but I'm sure a lot of women's schools are getting bombed. I mean, the Taliban is the worst of the worst, but that's not Mohammed, right? It is completely unfaithful. To, yeah, that's a prime example of like the what the like weaponizing of that's right versus the foundation aspect i mean if you granted like reading what we're reading right now i mean it's literally a complete 180 of what muhammad was kind of going muhammad was kind of going for specifically with he, he seemed like a very like uh uh yeah i guess like liberal like open-minded person someone who i don't know was very inclusive and i Granted, like it's not, it's definitely, the system is not perfect. Like women did only get half as much, but in, at least in that example, but that is like, I mean, kind of like you said, that's like, that is a huge move like that. I don't know. That's, that's taking great strides. Well, until then women were property, right? And right. so it's a huge leap to say they are people. They're not property, right? Mm -hmm. And the only way to say that is to give them property. <laughs> you know, you could say it, but I mean, let's put your money where your mouth is. They get property, which means they get independence, right? So you're saying they actually are human beings and they can have agency, right? When you get property, you get agency. Um, yeah, that is absolutely amazing to me. 1200 years before mill you know mm -hmm. i still have a hard time is that really true <laughs> yeah 620 and 1850 that's just amazing mm -hmm. and it is just not the stereotype at all <laughs> okay so what else have we got um here we go so there were lots of themes for today. And oh, I'm sorry, my, my machine is just, I think actually, to tell you the truth, on Earth Day, I, I'm involved with these groups and they just won't let up. So Earth Day was really a big deal and I'm getting all this stuff. Um, I, I, this is how old I am, you all. I remember the first Earth Day. <laughs> really, I'm ancient history. And I was totally into it. I wanted to give a talk at my school. I had these two biology professors that were my friends. And I was completely into this. And I asked the principal if I could give a talk at the assembly. And he said, we're not going to rock the boat. It's business as usual. And it was so depressing because <laughs> I was trying to be a grown up, you know? Anyway, uh, my parents had friends that taught social studies. And so he organized a talk where there were like four social studies classes. Um, but there was one teacher who wore a green headband, and that was that meant a lot to me that somebody cared. And it wasn't my teacher, but I clearly remember that guy walking down the hall with a green armband. And it's just really important for us to realize at different points in our lives what some little thing, what a difference that can make to somebody else's life. Uh, that's why Melanie, when she says she wants to be a coach, I was like, oh boy. I mean, coaches are influential. They have, you know, so much influence. And um, that's a very responsible position. I think I would just second guess myself way too much. But anyway, so Let's do the, uh, the woman thing. I'll just page through this. Uh, the politics of body images. Okay, 
clocking in. What did you guys think? They think, you know, the other side of it is women who think they have to, you know, get up and wear, be half naked and have all this makeup on and do their hair and everything, that they're more oppressed because they get treated like objects. Whereas you cover your body, then you have to treat the woman like a person. What do you guys think? Did that surprise you? Nobody has a response? I mean, something, I don't know. I definitely think like there's a sort of aspect, we don't, I mean, looking through like American politics and granted, like, look, I mean, their version of in educating us on what's going on. I mean, I think that my original understanding was that women who are involved in this, like are more oppressed because I thought it was more of like a, they were forced to, they're forced to do all of these things. They're forced to cover up. They don't have any, like, I don't know, in my, in my mind, it seemed as though they didn't have any choices to make. And it was like the most extreme, like for modesty, I felt like it's like the most extreme way to like, a uh, enforce that but I recently I mean I I kind of already knew going into this reading a little bit more about it just because I used to watch I don't know if you ever watched it on TLC it's called Nine Day Fiance and this is kind of a really funny example but there was a woman who was a part of Christianity and then she was in the process of converting because she was um engaged to a man who was you know, Muslim and she her mother was telling her this entire time she was like you are literally about to give up everything you are going to have nothing like for yourself and um she like went on an interview later on it was like after they were already made it was like honestly it's not what people think like you just you aren't educated on things properly and i don't really remember a whole lot about the the interview but i just remember her t like telling people that it's not like women are oppressed to the extent like you know like people here think that, that they are so I don't know that's kind of my opinion okay I mean again if you start competing for the male gaze you know if you get comments from guys about whether they like your outfit or not I mean that's another way of being oppressed right always worrying about how you look to men um, okay, so the politics of, of knowing, um, yeah, okay, so I had said already that Buddhism, the reason I teach Buddhism and Hinduism in a world philosophies class is because these were not religions, that was a way to demonize them, right, that was a way to belittle them and promote Christianity as the only religion that's modern and progressive and whatever. So they did the same with Islam. Okay, so the Quran can be interpreted as pro-feminist, all right, but it can be interpreted as sexist, right? It's certainly a way of life, and there's anti-feminist aspects to it for wives. People can... There's a lot of Muslims who don't, would never consider having more than one wife in Indonesia and elsewhere, um, but it's possible, right? And then these other men can marry Jews or Christians, okay? Um, there's, so there is, there's definitely, if you want to find the quotes, you can find them. And then there's pro-feminist aspects that actually early on, women and men were treated more equally. This is also true in Christianity. In the early church, women and men were equal and they had communism, like they shared their material goods. And Paul had, Julia was a major leader in the Jesus movement and all this stuff. So it just got to be the religion got institutionalized, it became power, it be powerful and wealthy, and then it became more sexist. Um, Quran defends the weak against the strong, right? 
And here are the arguments for equality or respect. Way more progressive. This is 600 AD. This is what was going on in Europe. <laughs> was witch burning, incidentally, pouring hot lead down the mouths of any woman who lived alone and was suspected of being a witch. All right. So we're so advanced. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, getting pregnant, that's just awful, even if it's a rape, even if it's all sorts of other causes. But, you know, that I don't think Islam is the only religion that has that. All right. Um, then Muhammad favored a woman's right to retaliate but he said he was overruled. <laughs> and then you start to wonder what the heck, right? That's where it gets really iffy. That's why I like Socrates in the youth of Rome. Is it true because the God said so, or did God say so because it's true? And so Muhammad can't run behind and say, oh, I had this other revelation from God. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, all right, let's see. And so Sharia law, this is after Muhammad, and we talked about that before. There's the law that's written on your heart, and then there's the law that's written down. And Muhammad did not want this because he knew it would become legalistic and it would lose the spirit of the religion. And that's exactly what happened. So Jesus criticized the, um, the Talmud and the Torah because it was the Jews had just gotten all caught up in, in this legal system and all these rules that Jesus rejected. And then Buddha criticized the Hindus, Hindu Brahmins for the same thing. And so Muhammad did not want this to happen. He also did not want this huge fight between his brother and his son-in-law which led to the Sunni and the Shia. Obviously, he wouldn't have wanted that. Here are all the arguments for the progressive treatment of women given the basic worldview of Islam. Um, and Islam early on, Muhammad was much more progressive. So I would say, um, Mia, if you remember, I said that our founding fathers were religious heretics, right? They had a new idea. Muhammad was a religious heretic, right? He had a totally new idea of God from the um, Hamid, the group, the monotheists. And then when he brought the Quran, that was totally new, right? And so he was a religious heretic. He was an innovator in religion. Our founding fathers were. And he was obviously politically a revolutionary too. He led a political movement. He didn't have any respect for, the, for his founding fathers, right? <laughs> he didn't have any respect for tradition. So how does it get this way? How does it get morphed into this? Um, all right, so, so all of these, these virtues, um, that, that was that one. And I think these things connect to the other things that we're doing. Um, let me see what I, oh yeah, the ecology one I'll do next. Because, and I'll do this outline. Because this guy understands what he calls traditional Islam. Traditional Islam is the, is the humanistic version. And it emphasized the arts. And it emphasizes all the virtues that I talk about, right? So the list of Aristotelian virtues, the way the culture works, the emphasis on the arts, the way of life, that is a traditionalist. But now there are fundamentalists and then modernists. So, um, okay. God rejoices in the creation. The creation is good. So this is... Christianity, Judaism, and Islam uh, rejoice in the creation, whereas Buddha and Hindu see it as ma maya, right? Illusion. It's underneath there that you're really headed, you know, you care about. 
um, the Westerners separated science from the sacred, whereas Hindus and Buddhists, the inner that inner energy is now being thought of like quantum physicists think of it as much more consistent with the way the universe is, that it's constant energy in motion. But at the time, you know, it's just called the spiritual as opposed to the physical, whereas Western dogma, Western science is dogmatically attached to just the physical. Um, so we need to recover, rediscover the sacred, the sacred in nature, right? That's what Hindus and Buddhists understand. Um, Okay, Iran wanted environmental development, but oil, you know, oil won the day uh, because guess what? Somebody could make money off of it. Um, okay, so we tend to respond to problems created by science and technology with more science and technology. So there's the traditionalist, the modernist, the fundamentalist. Okay. And so this is what I've been teaching you would be traditionalism, which is humanistic. Modernism is, is uh, science versus religion, and it's focusing on facts. And so the fundamentalists take that same methodology and obsess about the texts. It's a fact that this, you know, you can quote a Bible quote for whatever it is you want to do. And that's, that's fundamentalism. It takes this modern um, uh, method of learning about something and applies it to texts that were not written by people who had that in mind. The, people, the, the texts were written by people who, who believed in or taught in myths. Myths represent patterns underneath the physical stuff. It looks like a story about people. It's really about patterns. Okay, fundamentalists take it literally. So, and they also accept modern development and they accept that God will intervene if God wants to change it. So it's interesting that the most extremist Muslims and the most extremist Christians agree that we don't have to worry about environmental protection. Um, all right, let's see. In the traditionalist, all the disciplines are integrated. Um, okay, the universe is a mirror reflecting a higher reality, and we are the microcosm in the macrocosm. Okay, let's see. All right. So any questions about that? Were you able to follow that this article would be about a lot of the same themes that we've talked about. <laughs> um, let's see. The environmental ethics, that's the article I wanted you to read. Oh, there's the article I wanted you to read. Here's the outline of the one I wanted you to read. So this one is about um, the environment is God's creation. And so did you have any um, questions or comments on that? Could you follow it? Did it all make sense, given what we've done already? Okay, because we have the same, it's, we have the same Genesis story between these three religions. They have the same Genesis story. <laughs> And so, I mean, it seems pretty obvious that we should take care of the earth based on that story, but it's not necessarily how, it's not how the story is getting used right now. Um, it's really being perverted. Let's see. Okay, I guess I'll move on if you don't have questions or comments. Anybody have a comment? Um, all right. So the next. The next section here is I did go to Indonesia. Indonesia has more moderate Muslims than the whole Mideast. Okay. It has more Muslims than the whole Mideast. 
but it has more moderate Muslims than the whole Mideast. And I didn't know any of this stuff. And we should know this because we should keep working with Indonesia and other countries because there are extremists always coming in there trying to recruit. So here's what goes on in the high schools. And you can tell me if this rings a bell, does this happen in your high school? So kids in high school want to belong, right? When you go through puberty, you worry about what your friends think. You want to have friends. You want to get into groups. You want to be accepted into a group. So in high school, what these recruiters, so these people really want Indonesia to become an extremist Muslim state run by imams, right? There's a whole movement all over the world. People are trying to change the whole world into conservative Islam. And the way they do it is that they have a club, you know, in the high school. And so there's club carnival, basically. And they recruit by these kids that are alienated, right? Maybe they don't get along with their families or their families are super conservative. And so they're not allowed to really participate in social and political life or anything at the high school because it's not it's not traditional enough. And so somebody will say, do you think that this women's liberation is horrible and Muhammad condemns it? And we need to get back to the Quran and we need to re be really serious about Islam. And we're degenerating, right? We're letting these corporations come in. We're getting greedy. We're letting uh, Westerners, Americans exploit us. We're buying all this crap from America. We have all these advertisements with women half naked and it's very degenerate and it's very bad. And Mohammed is, is against it. And, and, you know, there's plenty of kids that are going to go, yes, well, that's our club. We have this club and we're going to keep, keep uh, true Islam alive. That's their mission. Well, then among that group, they, the organization will sort of pick out the kids that they think might be willing to, to commit violence for Islam. And, they, and um, now, does that sound familiar to you? I mean, when I heard this guy, I thought, well, that goes on in America. Do you think that goes on in America? that you recruit kids that are alienated and then you start using them for your own purposes? <laughs> I don't know, go ahead, you guys. Do you know any organizations that you would say are pretty authoritarian? They might not be religious authoritarian, but they recruit kids that are sort of alienated and then they, exercise a lot of power over them what do you think mia um i feel like that's a big thing honestly which i don't know if this is like an organization that you were thinking of but like or in high school we did like student council or i mean we did it all throughout school but you know being at least for us like you have to do like volunteer work and i don't know in order to sort of i don't know the kind of the way that uh I guess high school, I guess the, I'm thinking my middle school sponsor, not my high school one, but he always wanted to brand at, brand us sort of as people who are really inclusive. So we would sort of like, yeah, sort of recruit people, I guess, like you said, that were alienated or people that were sort of considered different, you know, in the school to make us look like we were like super inclusive and like, I, I don't know, it, it definitely, it definitely benefited us I think more than whatever work we would do like uh, for example we did obviously my where I lived is very religion based and everything so we did a lot of mission like little mission work I guess you could consider it and so one of the things that we did was in the summer um, most of us were a part of Fuge, or Fuge Camp which is something that the Baptist Church kind of holds 
and you go to New Mexico and you help all of these people that are, you know, struggling and I guess unfortunate and have, are suffering, suffering poverty and things like that. But the way that you know that we're kind of branding ourselves is like, hey, like, let's make sure that we frame this photo a certain way. Like, let's all pose for this picture. Like, let's, this is what we're going to do in this picture. Make it look like we're doing these things. And it's like, yeah, you know, it, you know, it helps us more than it. it we're, we're benefiting a lot out of it. I feel like more than whatever work we would do for them. So. Okay. There's also the kids from the prep schools. Um, I think, yeah, in my other classes, I assign chapters from a book where it's all about getting into a, an Ivy League school. And it just is to make your resume look good so you'll get accepted into the best college. It's really cynical. Oh, yeah, for sure. I did a lot of, like, I was involved in so many things in high school just so I could put it on my, like, application, my resume, so that it would be like, wow, you need to stand out. But I am now, like, very burned out and like it it drains you more than it helps you like you get into places sure but now I'm just tired so it's like what I I hurt myself more than I helped myself there actually everything is about lesson learned right like how can you use that to strengthen you right um so it's not only to build your own resilience. So when you notice it again, you don't let yourself get hooked into this, right? But it's also being able to give other people advice, right? So I, I do think everything that happens to us ends, turns into how do we think about it, right? And how do we use it? Like the thing itself is hardly ever completely good or bad. But what we do with it makes a huge difference about whether ultimately it has a positive or negative effect on our overall life, our whole life trajectory. Does that make sense, Mia? Yes, ma'am. But what about you, Jack? Did you ever do you can you understand the story of alienated kids or how that how the problem of kids wanting to fit in can get abused? Yeah, I guess that could be like used for like military recruitment. Yeah. Sometimes. Not not always, but sometimes. Yeah, sometimes it's just flat out the recruiter gets told to tell them that they'll get citizenship if they join. And then they don't. Yeah. Right? That's the worst. But anyway. Okay, so there was that problem. Then another thing, another guy read a paper and I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly like the US. So the question is, does religion in relation to a disaster like 9-11 or in Indonesia, it's the tsunami. You, do you remember that huge tsunami? Um, anyway, just any kind of natural disaster and there are going to be plenty of them. Um, does religion make people more resilient or does it make them fatalistic, right? It's resilience if they say, okay, this is a test. Um, God wants us to bounce back, you know, not feel sorry for ourselves. Um, it's God's will or is it, it make it worse because people say there's nothing we can do about it. They don't say we need science. Like we need to prevent these problems. We need to, to go sustainab sustainable, right? So with, with climate catastrophe, is religion gonna help people face it and then the scientists are gonna work on it? Or is religion gonna make it worse because they won't let the scientists work on it because that's defying God's will, <laughs> right? Um, that resilience is the capacity to withstand loss, which is important. Uh, but how about preventing loss, right? <laughs> Science and technology. And then I think the union of reason and faith is what is needed in the South. And it's needed a lot of places, but I, especially when I'm teaching at Lyon, I think. 
that's what I always have to emphasize, um, that it shouldn't be an either or, and, it, and the one should not split the other one. Like the scientists shouldn't say, get this religion out of here so we can deal with climate change. And the religion people should not say, get that science out of there because God's in control. We should say, God wants us to use our brains. Why did you think we got them, <laughs> right? You know, what kind of God is it that gives you a universe you can understand, a brain that can understand it, and then says, I dare you to use it. <laughs> that's crazy. And that's, that's really going to get more and more important in your lifetime. Um, there's the purely secular responses, right? That blaming, finding someone to blame. And there are plenty of people that will blame those religious kooks, right? Or the religious folks blame those dang scientists for their pride and their greed. Okay, then there's... Um, Future disasters, what is God's will and what is human will? And in your lifetime, there's gonna be so much of this. Um, how will politicians take advantage of it? So you've got to spot that. When politicians, you know, punch people's buttons um, and take, take focus groups and Gallup polls and tell people what they want to hear and make it a whole lot worse. So how can you develop hope and a positive worldview without being deluded, right? I mean, you do have to get up in the morning and you do have to do the best you can do in your life. And I don't think you should base it just on consequences. You just do it because it's the right thing to do. And also because it's the best thing you want to ask, what's my best contribution? What can I control? What makes me feel satisfied? Uh, what's a meaningful life for me? And so I know that I've made my contribution. Um, so what do you think? What's your impression about whether religion you want to give examples of religion leading to resilience and religion leading to fatalism? Okay, Jack. Um, it's probably more fatalistic, in my opinion. Because, I, I don't know, just kind That's of saying it's... No. Not really. I just think it's more just saying it's God's will is not healthy. Instead of right. No, I meant that that's what you hear from the people around you most of the time. Yeah. That's what I meant. I don't, not that you would think so, but that you, that's what you associate religion with fatalism because that's mm -hmm. what you've seen. Does that make yes, sense? Okay. Do you think it's a good religion? No. Okay, so, all right. It's, I don't think it's what Jesus would advocate, right? No. Okay, because he said whoever does, not, not people who say, Lord, Lord, those who do the will of the Father. Okay. Um, what about you, Mia? Which one do you, how do you associate these? Do you think religion is good at resilience or it's basically fatalistic and makes things worse? Mm, I think, I think like it can, they can use resilience as like an excuse, but I do agree that it's sort of fatalistic just because a lot of times religion, I mean, like you said, like God's will, people, they will literally use excuses to be like, well, well, God, like, it was in God's plan like let's just sit back and like let God's plans unfold but like at some point you really I mean we have to I don't know it's like you said earlier I mean why why would God give us a brain if we can't use it so like why why can't we use what we know to kind of help fix or help with whatever disasters come our way you know I mean if we have resources we should use them because God gave them to us it's not like uh, yeah, that's kind of what I think. 
Yeah, I mean, the, we have the resources to destroy the creation, but we also have the resources not to destroy the creation. So, you know, you really want to bet your whole eternal life <coughs> that we weren't supposed to use it uh, to preserve the creation. I, I don't understand it, but I do want to tell you now that I live back in the north, um, northerners really do not. I don't think they understand that how many people are just saying it's in God's hands, you know, because that doesn't get in the news very much, right? It's the QAnon that gets in the news or all sorts of nutty things. But there's just a lot of just plain old vanilla flavored Christians <coughs> who just say that, right? It's in God's hands. Does that make sense to you? I think the thing that makes me really sad is that I, I kind of want to just be a grandma that stands back and listens to my grandkids. And I want them to think of me as just a nice lady. Um, but it just makes me so sad when I think of these other grandmas. And really, at their, at their memorial service, it's like, Oh, grandma, she was so wonderful. She like spent her life trying to stop abortions and she just voted Republican because she was so committed to stopping abortions. And we just have to love her because she did everything she could, you know? And it's just like, oh, I mean, keeping abortion legal makes for fewer abortions just for starters. And it's just, it just makes my heart bleed that um, someone can be that naive and it can be respected so deeply, right? Just that inability to, to realize you're getting jerked around by some really wicked people. Does that make sense to you that it just makes, it just agonize about that? What about you? Are you guys just young and you're not into agony? <laughs> what do you think when you hear, you know, you'd go to memorial service and like she's the closest thing to a living angel? <laughs> well, does it make you uncomfortable? That somebody would have that many good intentions, be that gentle and kind, and be that suck, you know, that sucked into somebody else's world. No, Jack, <laughs> somebody respond. I mean, I don't know. I've never, I can't say I've ever been to a memorial service where anyone's, everyone's like, she was an angel. Most of, I mean, most of the memorial services or whatever have been for, or like funeral services, have been for my family members. And when my family hosts a funeral, they just, they just kind of like, kind of poke fun at each other. They're like, hey, remember all of these funny things that are also really stupid that this person did because they didn't learn their lesson well they did it and then everyone laughs so I don't know I've never had a funeral where everyone's like where she was like she did all of these good things like my my family doesn't do funerals like that so <laughs> okay. I don't know <laughs> all right what about you Jack I've never been to a funeral like that well can you imagine there being people like that yeah, for like a celebrity or something. Well, no, it would be a very naive woman who was just sort of kept in a bubble her whole life, mm. right? I don't know. Anyway, so so that is an issue, though. And I remember when he presented it, I thought, well, this is just like Christianity. <laughs> it just kept the patterns kept repeating. It was so amazing to me. Um, so here's a terrorism article that I, uh, a lecture that I gave. So I asked you to read the environment one and the women one. And then I, uh, I have an outline about terrorism. And my thing is that 
resilience, right? How do you build resilience to terrorism? Are we prepared? And what about self-control, right? So if, you, if we consume too much stuff and we have energy consumption, then we go out and try, and we have these wars for oil, right? And we get, we go into these countries and we treat the people like dirt and we create terrorists. Uh, does that make sense? That our lack of self-control and our greed makes us more vulnerable to terrorism. Does that make sense to you guys? But nobody says that, right? Nobody says that. But all right, that's what I would say. Courage, are we responding appropriately when it comes to fear? Did we overreact from 9-11? Yes, we did. What about COVID? Are, do people fear the right things for the right reason in the right way? Well, certainly they disagree, right? Is it more, is the vaccine more to be feared than getting COVID and perpetuating the pandemic and letting it morph into another variable or whatever, right? <laughs> so, you know, people, it's unbelievable because 9-11 and COVID triggered fear. And then you look at what people are afraid of and how afraid they are. And people completely disagree. Um, and I think that, you know, if we don't get a handle on the pandemic, we're, we're more prone to, we're more vulnerable as a country than we were if we, you know, just sort of get it together. If we're divided within, which COVID has caused us to be divided within, then again, terrorists, people can start, you know, separating off and more and more kind of extreme behavior. Um, the politicians can use it. Are we making the, what about generosity? What about our, what our public money goes to? Well, actually it's more like $2,400 a year per person. Is this making us more safe? And also, is this a kind of generosity? Are we exercising generosity? So these are approximately what our tax money pays for to the federal government. It's really more like $2,400 a year to military. Health and Human Services, 200. Education, 200. Department of State, 150. That's diplomacy. <laughs> so what? What is that, 100 times more money? Wait, 10 times more money, 15 times more money for military. Um, Homeland Security is another 100. Housing, 100. Justice, agriculture, energy. How much of our wars are related to energy? Hello but we don't do anything to develop green energy, environmental protection. Department of the Interior preserves our own national parks and national lands. Um, do you think we responded appropriately after 9-11? Uh, did we respond appropriately after COVID? What do you think we're gonna do next time? Um, what about ambition? Did people use these events, COVID and 9-11, to promote their personal ambitions at the expense of the public good? So even though I have the example of 9-11, it's good, I think, that I just left it and you can fill in COVID and it's all the same stuff, right? So you have to get the patterns and then you'll get that this is gonna happen again and again. So you have to sort of understand the pattern. What kind of rhetoric would they use? They use God uh, in both cases. I have, I have some students 
who, who is not, I have a student who's not going to get vaccinated because it's the sign of the beast in the book of Revelation, right? So it's evil. Vaccines are evil. Um, you know, somebody else will say those fundamentalists are destroying our democracy. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, it's the same stuff that we had 20 years ago. What kind of behavior ought to be rewarded and who should be promoted uh, based on the best reaction? Who should we honor, right? Should we honor Mr. Fauci or should we demonize him? People completely disagree on just about everything. Uh, what about military families in the case of 9-11? Do we honor military or do we also honor diplomacy? Um, rational humor, how can you develop a sense of humor to stay sane? Uh, sociability, this is really important because we don't want to use these disasters to polarize us, right? We have to find a way to get along. We have to find a way to listen to each other. Then we have the problem with the media and 20 years ago, it was 9-11, but with COVID, right, it's getting worse. Social media, it's getting worse. And then I used Snowden. He's still, he's still a, an issue in the news, um, but there's lots of other stuff going on today. It just seems to me this is variations on a theme. Uh, what laws should we make? In 9-11, we passed the Patriot Act, which really gave the government a lot more power over us. Was that the right thing to do? Um, I think it was an overreaction and politicians voted for it without even reading it. It was like 350 pages, but a vote came up and if you voted against it, you're not gonna get reelected. So that was the end of that. Um, Let's see, how should science and technology, how should social science be used to prevent terrorism? And terrorism at this point is white supremacy also, because the white supremacist groups have been categorized as terrorists. So we have them within our country. Um, all right, so I, I think, yeah, all right, that's what we've already covered. But I do think that liberally educated people, liberal education, the characteristics of a liberally minded person in Lion, Lion's catalog, those are the people that, that the world needs to try and build the bridges, to try and get people to talk to each other. So you, you know, you will have to spend the next 40 years functioning in this world. And right now it's a very polarized world. And um, I just I just hope, literally, I pray for you. <laughs> I don't have any hotline to God, however, and I don't pretend to, but um, but so I want you to wrap it up with some comment about what are some of your takeaways from all of this material. So we had Islam, right? I started out with Islam, Muhammad, the virtues. Then we looked at the Quran. We looked at the notion of creation. We looked at some of those news articles about trying to censor the Quran or trying to teach the Quran. And then the difference between what the scholars say about certain quotes in the Quran about killing the infidel, the non-Muslims, and then they say, no, that was Surya 9, that was a specific context. Um, and then we have all the stuff about women, we have the environment, we have terrorism. Um, so hopefully by this point you understand I've organized the class according to these patterns. Whoops, did Mia disappear? Um, did you have a takeaway, Jack, from what we've studied with Islam? Um, I definitely think we overreacted to 9-11. I think that um, all their virtues in Islam are 
pretty much the same as Aristotle. So, so how do how is Islam discussed? Just you know, now it's twenty years later. When you whenever you hear people talking about Islam, is it just assumed that it's like the Antichrist or what? Yeah, that's how it's kind of um, described. Okay, so that's become a part of our national conversation. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think I had you reading those articles where right after 9-11, there was this opportunity, right? Yeah. And Bush said that he wanted it to be a moment of coming together, but the vice president, Cheney, and his group uh, used it as a huge wedge to divide people. So would you say that in general, one more um, strike against liberals is that they like terrorists or they're not tough enough on Muslims and those are terrorists? No. No, so that's not it. It's just this common understanding that Islam is bad. Okay. Because, as I said, if right a, the year or so afterwards, it was demonizing the humanists. Remember, Pat Robertson and all yeah. those people. Um, so, the so I just don't know if that took right. I mean, politicians throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks, you know. Um, but I will say that the QAnon thing has started this huge number of people that think that the Democrats are running some kind of pedophile organization. Have you heard of that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Crazy. well, the thing that's interesting is that that's what Putin did. Every time he had a political enemy, he accused him of being a pedophile. And that's <laughs> what all authoritarian dictators do. So, I mean, it breaks my heart to see that there are these obvious patterns and we live in a free and open society and we can find that out, right? It's not hard to find that out. We're not censored from that, but that is what you should be learning, right? And that's what the humanity side of the education is about. And that's why just teaching more science is just not gonna get us there. Does that make sense, Jack? Yes, ma'am. You appeal to people's sexuality their, um, and their sensuality and their lost innocence and their, I mean, it's natural to desire to protect innocent children, my God. What's more natural than that? And then how politicians very cynically abuse that. Um, so that's what you study, or that's what you should study in the humanities. And the humanities are not respected anymore, and they're getting cut. And um, the, the PhD dissertations are, are minutia. They're useless. When I went to grad school, they were proud of the fact that what they were doing was useless. Just, oh my gosh, there's so many ways to go wrong. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I do hope somehow the class can give you some tools. I will say that Melanie's posts are just getting better and better. And so if Melanie ends up listening to this um, video, I will say that her stuff is getting better and better and it's really a joy to read it. So um, have you handed in something lately, Jack? I think I'm caught up on the reading. No, ma'am. Okay. Um, so, can I discuss for my essay tomorrow night? Sure. Do you wanna, you wanna meet me for an office hour tomorrow? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'll write that down. Um, tomorrow's Monday and I can always have office hours. It's just that people don't come. And so I just get to the point where all you have to do is ask. Yeah. Um, 
So that's great, Jack. I've got you done. We'll see you. Yes, ma'am. See you. Bye-bye.